All right. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of uh, Ridge Talk. I'm Justin. Uh, we've got Daniel with us again as well, and Sean. And uh, as always, feel free to like or subscribe to the podcast with the information that's provided there below. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions for us, either based on the sermon series that we're currently involved in, uh, or just any other questions for us or about the faith, you can feel free to send those in. Uh, we actually had two questions come in uh, over the past couple of weeks since the last episode. Now, one of them comes all the way from Brazil. That's right. We've got a listener down in Brazil, at least one. We've gone international. Yeah, we've gone international. <laughs> uh, but his question was in Portuguese, so we weren't going to answer it. Um, <laughs> now, actually, he's one of the missionaries yeah. that um, connects with us here and is fully engaged with the ministry. And um, he was just asking if, uh, you know, We've been talking through the faith, you know. We've, we've been talking about why. Why do you believe in God? That kind of stuff. And he's just asking, do you guys have a personal story you can share as to uh, what keeps you, uh, you know, what what led you into the faith, or you know, a, a significant God moment that happened in your own life? So I didn't know, Daniel, if you had uh, an example to share or not. Yeah, I mean, the question at its core was kind of about like, you know, is your, what's your testimony? Why are you a Christian? And, you know, what led you there? And I, I think for me, it's a number of things. Uh, one of the things we've talked about, I think, before is, you know, plausibility structures. And like, hey, I grew up in a home with two Christian parents, and I was going <laughs> to church you know, nine months before I was born. And so like, that's just kind of the, the world in which I grew up. And so I think that's a big part of it. Um, but then as I, as I grew and I began to study the scriptures for myself, which I really, I probably began to do seriously. Like I memorized a lot of scripture growing up. And so a lot of it was internalized, uh, but like really studying the scriptures for myself began probably when I was a, a freshman in high school. Mm. And um, you know, I started, did, I did start comparing it to all the other world religions and like what's going on out there. And to me, it, it still seemed the most plausible that I, as I kind of looked at the word of God, it just made sense to me. Um, and I've, I've kind of continued in that it's, it seems to be the most logical. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just say there is something about being connected to a community of people who are trying to walk out the same things that is just so enticing and engaging. And so part of it for me, you know, uh, the Apostle John says, you'll know, uh, they'll know that you are, um, uh, they'll know we are, are Christians by our love. That right. was the idea that he said. And I'm yep. just, the, the love and the compassion and the grace and the forgiveness and just the things that I have experienced um over the course of my life connected to people within the church is enough to make me think, you know, I, I have seen hearts change, lives change. I've seen my own uh, heart change over a number of issues. And I, I just think that that kind of heart change really is only possible through the, the Holy Spirit giving the growth. And so hmm. I don't know if I have a single, you know, I, th I think for some people it's it's more experiential, and there or there might be like a moment. Uh, you we were talking. About, I think you've got something you want to share for that. But for me, it's just over the course of of a lifetime, uh, tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because the question you know you can receive a question like this at any given time, and the example that pops into your mind might be different uh, depending on when you hear it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, my story is similar to yours in that, um, you know, I grew up in church, uh, you know, started going to church as early as I can remember. And um, I don't think I crossed the threshold to actually professing my faith until middle school, junior high age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm old enough now that I can remember... Uh, Gideon's handing out a free Bible to all of the students in my elementary school. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the kids in my class was like drawing in marker on the pages. And there was something in my mind that was like, I don't think you're supposed to do that. Like, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why that's not a good thing. But something's telling me that that's not, you know, that that's not a good thing. Um, but I still didn't cross that line until middle school. Um, my my mother and some others in our church at that time were the uh, the youth leaders, volunteer leaders, and I remember just very vibrant uh, youth ministry and crossing the line of faith at that point in time. Um, but there was one time in junior high, um, 
my parents were going on a weekend church retreat and I was going to get to spend the entire weekend uh, at my grandparents' house. When you're a kid, there's nothing like going to your grandparents' house. Um, you get you get all the cookies and uh, soda and pop and you know whatever else you want. And um, you know the the short story is I had one foot out of the car, one foot in the car. My father thought <clears throat> that I had gotten out of the car and started to drive the car forward. So he drove the uh, Buick Skylark up on the back of my left foot. Oh no! <laughs> it was brutal. And, uh, you know, in my mind, I was like, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. Uh, you know, I didn't want to ruin this weekend. And they were like, you just had a car on the back of your leg. Like, you've got to right. go to the hospital. Right. Um, so we went to a local hospital, and uh, they took x-rays. And they, the x-rays clearly showed a, uh, a break in the ankle. Um. And uh, the on-call doctor just wasn't coming, wasn't coming, wasn't responding to his probably pager at that point in time. Mm, It was before the the days of cell phones. Um, So we ended up just going to a different hospital where they took some more x-rays from different angles. um, Had the on-call doctor there when we arrived. And uh, he's putting the x-rays up side by side from the first hospital and the ones they took. And he's like, clearly your foot was broken. Uh, when you had these taken and it's not broken now um, and we're just you know we're looking at the pictures like uh, he, he's like what like what happened and they're like we prayed for him that that's what happened uh-huh. um, so that's just kind of a part of my story I think of seeing how God can work in uh, just big ways in your life and why God chooses to heal in one situation and not in another. You know, I'll never really know the answer to that. Um, but I did have at least that one experience in life where I'm like, wow, this is uh, not, you know, not only am I going to a church, not only am I a part of a vibrant youth ministry. We talk about the power of God, but now I see and experience that in my own life in a real way. So, yeah. I didn't know if Sean had a story to share or not, or if we just uh, go on to question number two. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know that I'll get real specific with stories, but I think the plausibility structure thing is what came to my mind um, of just, you know, you can't help but know the fact that you grew up in a Christian home. Right. Same for me. So there's obviously like a bias there. I, as an adult and as a Christian leader, sometimes feel the need to like really dig underneath that bias to try to... um, you know, for whatever credibility sake and just really um, making sure that, you know, I'm not just here because it's the only experience that I've known and it's the easy thing to fit into. And I think I've done a decent amount of that work. I don't know, like, at what point you satisfy that or not. Sure. I'm to the point now where this is what I (laughs) believe. Um, And that, that is really bolstered then by those experiential things that you talked about as well, Daniel, which is, um, you know, you can have all of the theological knowledge, you can Mm -hmm. set it up against other belief systems, compare and contrast, and you can make it purely an intellectual exercise where it is, okay, this, the plausibility structure is based on the, you know, assessment that I made from that and I, and I've done that to a degree, probably not as extensively as some have, um, you know, and landed there. But I think for me, it really comes down to the combination of things, right? Like you add experience into there, you add um, really just uh, you know plausibility structures that are that are based on um, you know what you've seen other people that you seem to respect, know, trust. Um, and for me, oftentimes it's like, well, that person's a whole lot smarter than me. Sure. <laughs> and so I, I don't know how uh, <clears throat> wise that is or whatever. But you know, I have had some some experiences that uh, have been directly tied to prayer, <laughs> where it's it, where God moved in a miraculous way, where I have no other explanation other than to say 
the simplest explanation is that God exists, that God heard me and that God responded in a very mm. tangible, real way in real time. Um, you know, it's funny, some people, if you just had that in isolation, I think a lot of people would push back against that and try to look for like, well, where are you confirming your bias or you're mm. just primed to sort of interpret those types of things as God because that's your worldview. And I just go, maybe that's true. Um, but the simplest explanation is, you know, in that moment, it was an instantaneous response to something mm. that I was praying for, whether it was a physical healing, um, you know, there was a time uh, where, you know, uh, just a few times where there's just been uncanny things that I can directly relate to a prayer that I prayed and there was a response, you know, so closely tied to that, that it was like, to try to come up with some other explanation, I feel like would be doing more mental gymnastics than just going, oh, maybe this thing, this God that I believe in, uh, that is, that I also believe is so much more than just uh, intellectually knowable through the study of scripture, but is actually wanting a personal relationship with me yeah. that exists both in my study of scripture, but also like in a, in, in a way that is relational in real time. Uh, I've, I've, I would say that I've experienced that and I continue to experience that. And it's what, um, you know, makes me continue to have hope that, um, that all the other systems, all the other understandings, all the other intellectual exercises, um, uh, are not like, you know, leading to some conclusion where we just can't know. I, I do believe that God is real, that he's knowable. He wants to um, be known by us. As we're kind of talking about this, it, it's reminding me, I don't know if you guys have seen the um, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Where there's like the four kind of ways that we can know. And, exp and I, think it, I think it's scripture, uh, script, scripture, scripture uh, I think it's received wisdom or tradition, yeah. it's logic, and then um, experience. experience. And those are kind of the four things that we look to and say, these are the things that kind of help, <clears throat> they're, they're like ways of knowing or ways of kind of deciphering, you know, what's going on in our lives and how we experience God. And I think all of the, I think it's such a, it's such a clever way of thinking through things because really all of those things are at work in everything that we do. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm going to be remiss if I don't talk about, you know, because the question's about why do you believe? Like what's, what's the gospel? The reality <laughs> is, I mean, we're, we, we're Christians and we, we're leaders in a Christian church and we talk about Christianity. There are other ways of life that, that, uh, ways of living that produce flourishing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there there are other ways. You you can't just look and say that there are no other ways that, that uh, flourish. Uh, but to me, it's so it's not just about what works or what I've experienced. There's got to be something deeper there. And for me, genuinely, the core of the gospel is if, if you look at all the other things, it's a well ordered life. Right. If you have a well-ordered life, you're doing well, you're going to flourish and it's all good. But if, if the crux of the matter is that there is a God who created and we are no longer in right relationship with him, we have to be brought into right relationship with him. That's what all the world religions really are seeking to answer. How do you, something's wrong. How do you correct what's wrong? And the answer of Christianity is we can't correct what is wrong. That's why Christ had to come and correct it mm -hmm. through his death and resurrection. And to me, if that's the crux of it, it makes more sense than anything else that any of my suffering or any of my uh, discarding my desires or any of my rigid discipline, what he did on the cross accomplishes more than what I could accomplish in any of my own effort. Um, but I, I think, I think you said it so perfectly, Sean, that, the, but then the experiences confirm <clears throat> what I believe to be true. And that, 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 that kind of thing, when you see this, the selfless love of Christ, it produces, I think a real correct God type of love that we, we experience together. And so I appreciate you sharing that. I think, I think that, uh, that transitions well into our next question, whether you intended it to transition well into the next question or not, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, I think it does. Um, so here's the second question we received, uh, for this episode. 
my question today is about the daily Christian life and what it practically looks like. Mm. In college, it was adventurous and fun. There was no real set schedule, mission trips to other countries, uh, to share the gospel, early morning prayer groups and Bible studies, life groups, and so on. Every day there was fellowship. And while I was stuck in the trap of feeling like I was doing so much for God, it was still a lot of fun. But now as an adult with a set job, spouse, uh, child, children, life has become very rhythmic, and I often feel guilty for not doing as much as I once did. What do you all think? What does a fulfilling daily Christian life look like? And what practically are some ways to share the gospel, fellowship with others, and etc., as compared to a life that no longer has the the freedom of time like you did in college days. So I have several thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got I a think lot. it's I think it's a great question. Um, yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot is season of life and being under, able to understand the season of life you're in uh, and, and live <laughs> live out of that. And so uh, so one of my thoughts, I really have two basic thoughts. One is, is related to that idea of seasons of life. Um, you know, I think we live in a world in which Christianity, uh, Christianity, especially like in, I would say modern American evangelicalism, th- there's this like trend and there has been for many, many years that like living for Christ is a, you gotta be radical. It's like this radical thing. And, and that's a really appealing message to college students because it is fun and adventurous. And by the way, they are untethered. Like there's, there's, you know, the most tethered you are is to a class schedule and maybe a job that you have. Uh, but you're, you're not tethered uh, in the sense of like a family that you're responsible for leading. You're not tethered to a really typically a nine to five. You know, the world is kind of your oyster at that point. You're also uh, not, I mean, and I'm not, I, I'm not saying this specifically facetiously you're not tethered mm-hmm. to a body that is more tired like there's something about <laughs> the amount of that's energy right. you have that's in your exactly 20s right. versus now too like that's a because you we were before we started the podcast you were talking about a time that you pulled an all-nighter in college and right. how, how often did we so it was like you know just the ability to uh have, Physically do that literally stuff, have yeah. more time at your disposal because and energy to fill yeah, that time. Yeah, uh, one of the verses that I thought of. So this is still connected to that first point was um, uh, James chapter uh, one verse two. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you experience trials of various kinds, for the testing of your faith produces radical faith that you're going to keep using for the rest of your lives. It's just going to be radical. Wait, that's not how the end of the verse is. It's, it produces steadfastness. Mm-hmm. And steadfastness is not a radical word. It, it's a word that literally, by the way, it's connected to the character of God, right? I am a God who's great, uh, merciful and gracious, uh, showing steadfast love. That, that, that faithful steadfastness is not a very fun, adventurous word for a college student, but but the scripture routinely talks about steadfastness as a mark of a maturing faith. I think the question he he had, he he talked about uh, it's more rhythmic. Life is more like we just have more established rhythms and patterns. And scripture would say, yeah, you're that's maturity. <laughs> like you're you are living into a more uh, rhythmic. Um, you, you're it's producing steadfastness within you, and steadfastness is a good thing because it's near uh, to the character of God. Um, and so that, that's kind of the first thing that I would say that as, as you're kind of growing and maturing, your life will look more steadfast. And that's a good thing. I, I think back to my own faith as a college student, <clears throat> man, I was down for anything. And I was, I was down for Bible studies all the time. And we had this other group that was meeting over here and we were doing worship in this thing. And, but also there were small, much smaller trials in my life and to my faith that would like knock me down. And I mean, totally knock me down. And those things don't knock me down anymore because I've, you know, I, I've lived through enough of them that, that that wave doesn't knock me down anymore. I think strength and steadfastness are the products of a maturing faith. The other thing that I thought of, and then I'll stop talking, you guys can talk, was this, the, in his question, I don't, even, I don't know if he said the word ought, but there's like an, there's an oughtness to what he's saying. Like, I feel like I'm not doing as much as I used to Mm -hmm. and that I ought to be doing what Mm -hmm. 
I used to be doing. Yeah. Uh, and that idea of yeah, ought he, this. He said he feels guilty for <clears throat> not doing as much as I once did. Yeah. That th- that idea of oughtness, and I think there's at one point C.S. Lewis talks a lot about oughtness, the oughtness of it all. And I, I think that is... Uh, the disparity between how God designed us to be in the garden and what, how we experience our lives as a result of sin and the fall, that we still carry with us this oughtness of how things ought to be, but we're not able to achieve things in that way. And that's why the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is such a big deal, is that he, he answers that oughtness that we can't answer. He, he fulfills that oughtness that we can never fulfill. Uh, and, and I think that is just as true for growth throughout your Christian maturity and Christian life as it is for when you first heard the gospel. That when you look at your life and go, I ought to be doing more. I I want to do what I was doing and had time to do back then. Uh, The truth, maybe that's true. Maybe you should be doing more, you know? But the truth of the gospel is because of the season that you're, of life that you're in, where you aren't able to do what you feel like you ought to be doing, Christ has covered that ground. That there's no, I think, I think we can rest from that feeling of oughtness and we can rest in the accomplished and fulfilled work of Jesus Christ, not just in his death and resurrection, but in the work that he accomplished throughout his life. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there is a... Um... You know, he used the word guilt. You know, I feel guilty for not being able to do as much as I once did. Um, but it does lead me to ask, is it guilt or is it shame? Yeah. Because guilt, you know, guilt says I did something wrong and I'm going to learn from it. Um, and shame says I'm not enough. Yeah. Um, no, know, I did something wrong, but I am wrong. Right. Uh, you know, guilt leads you back to close relationship with God and wanting to re-engage with him and shame leads you to want to hide from God. Mm. Um, so the feeling of, you know, I'm not able to do enough. Um, you know, I, I ask the question, who, who told you that? Where, where did that thought even come from? Um, m- maybe there is a conviction from the Holy Spirit mm. that, that you have some kind of a calling or purpose that isn't being fulfilled right now. Like, like that is possible. Um, but it's also possible that the enemy is leading you to feel ashamed for not doing more. Mm. And this is where the, uh, the idea that we try to teach on as consistently as we can, that uh, you know, who you are is so much more important than mm. what you do. Um, you know, you are a child of God. You are adopted into his family. You are kings and queens. Uh, you know, you, you are a, a friend of God. You are saints and not sinners. Um, when you grasp a hold of that and, you know, you, you keep that closed fisted, like, uh, yeah, I wasn't able to do everything that I wanted to do today, but that doesn't impact who I am. It doesn't impact my mm. final standing with God. My final standing with God has already been written. That's right. Uh, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful mm. servant, no matter what. So, you know, part of the question was, what are, um, let me see here. Let me, let me skim through it. I don't want to mess it up. Um, what does a fulfilling daily Christian life look like? And what are some ways practically to uh, share the gospel? I think that part of those daily rhythms and practices are those reminders mm-hmm. of uh, I am I am a friend of God. I am a saint. I am a child. I am adopted. I am a part of His family. All of those things. Um, you know, one of mine is I was created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. Uh, you know, I matter. Mm. You know, what, what I do matters. Um, those truths are just permeated throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospel message. And a, a good day can just be remembering those things and keeping my identity there and not on my own efforts because my own efforts are going to fall short every mm. time. Mm. So did you have more you wanted to add into that too, Sean? Yeah, <clears throat> I think... Um the way that I started to think about that was I think the way that I conceptualize what he's after is it's 
trying to think about fruitfulness. Mm. Um, and I think that it's f- fruitfulness in two places. One is in your own life, in your own personal relationship with Jesus. And then it's fruitfulness as it relates to, um, you know, as he put it, doing things for God. Mm. I would say that the better way of thinking about that is how are you like fruitfulness when it comes to um, your work in the kingdom. Mm. Um, In his example of being in college and having all of that time for Bible study and um, some of the other things that he mentioned there, Um, And now he talked about, you know, life is rhythmic, go to work, have a small child, have a marriage to tend to, um, you know, the the, the contexts for uh, that are different, but the two arenas kind of still exist. What is the fruitfulness that I want in my own personal um, relationship with Jesus? And then where... Uh, does my work in the kingdom kind of show up? Mm. Uh, in the college example, where you have all kinds of time for Bible study, for um, you know, going to group gatherings, for you know, a lot of that. If I had to guess, was you know times where you were sitting around singing or sitting sitting around like doing those things, and and I would go, all of those things are great. Uh, how much were they geared toward your own investment Mm. in your relationship with Jesus and fostering that and helping your own growth and your own commitment to him? Um, And how much of that was fruitful as far as reaching the world? Mm. Uh, I know in my own experience, you know, I went to a Christian college, so there was all kinds of opportunities for those things. Um, It was, it was not, ever really aimed that far outside of just my own edification, my own like being part of this community, being part of this almost like a subculture. Um, And I think that when that excitement or that level of intensity of those gatherings and things go away, we can make the mistake of going, well, that's less fruitful now. Mm. Um, You know, now as an adult with a a steady job, a marriage and a small child, personal fruitfulness? How can you um, have a fulfilling Christian life within that rhythmic context that isn't changing? Um, It would be, you know, what we've talked about a lot, which is uh, add an extra 20 minutes to your day beginning or end and spend that time in prayer, Mm -hmm. uh, listening to God, um, you know, petitioning on behalf of your family, whatever it might be. Um, As far as like, fruitfulness in the kingdom of God, where's, where's your primary like responsibility to see fruit? It's in your family. So it's in, you know, your, your marriage first, it's in, um, you know, helping to raise your child uh, to know and love Jesus. Um, and then here's the big one for me is I think that, you know, in college you, you're sort of in this, um, you know, community is, almost a byproduct, right? Like you're, that's if right. you're living on campus, that's one thing. Um, and even if not like here in Fairmont, like I don't know that a lot of people live on like Fairmont State's campus, but by the fact that you're all gathered in a mm-hmm. place, your your peers, you have all those things like community sort of is this built in thing. And I think one of the things that happens is as we get to be older, that goes away and we struggle for, um, you know, knowing what, how to foster community and those different things. Um, and then we, we all live in neighborhoods and how many of us know our neighbors, how many of us, or, you know, your coworkers, uh, it, it, it's as easy sometimes as like, um, you know, taking the step to, to get to know your neighbor for an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It's not just, I, I'm, I hope that they, um, end up, figuring out that I'm a, a Christ follower because I keep my yard nice and I'm right, like, right, I, right, right. a nice neighbor. Like there is that step, right? Like invite them over for dinner or um, different things like that. Like you can be faithful within that rhythmic context. Like who are you seeing every day? But I think the point you're making is that it's different depending yeah, on the stage of life to be in. like the big, uh, we, we went out as a group in college and, you know, try to do this, 
project where we reached people for Jesus. Now it it's like, well, you see your coworker every day. What are you doing this to, you know, help draw them to Jesus? Really, sometimes the stakes change, right? Like it's mm-hmm. easier, I think, sometimes in college when you've got that energy going, you've got the group, you've got all those things to to sort of like, um, the stakes are kind of relatively low as far as like investment in people. And if you get rejected and those types of things, right. especially like, um, you know, cause you all know, like we're here for a temporary amount of time when it's your coworker and, or it's your neighbor. It's like, well, if I, if I, uh, get rejected by them when I'm trying to share Jesus or whatever, like I'm still going to live next to them. I'm still going to see them every day. So I wonder if sometimes we just don't, um, see that the opportunities to be faithful just where we are um, are enough Mm. and that we try to, you know, find something bigger or more exciting or whatever that feels that way. And and one of the other things that I would say is I love this example that I have heard um, one of my favorite preachers talk about a lot when he talks about stage of life. He's like, you know, parents of little kids trying to find time with Jesus and what is enough and what is like, you know, enough to satisfy that mysterious question of like, what's enough to not feel guilty? What's enough to feel like I'm growing this and that? And and the example that he gives a lot is Susanna Wesley, um, John and Charles Wesley's mom. And you know, she was raising, I forget, it was a pile of kids, a bunch of kids. And uh, she would do this thing where she would be in the kitchen and she would pull her apron up over her head and kneel and pray for like two, three minutes at a time. And those kids knew like, hey, if mom's doing that, leave her alone. And that was like the small little moment that she carved out with God during her day. Hmm. And what I love about that example is on is obviously like, you know, it was this small amount of time, right? But she did it faithfully. And then through the ministry to her family, raising hmm. her children, two giants in the faith who had a profound impact on church hmm. history, um, you know, came, came from her household. So I would also say like, um, I think intentionality matters a whole lot more than the amount of time, the amount of energy, mm-hmm. um, you know, start by giving God five, 10 minutes, but do it consistently mm-hmm. rather than I'm, I'm guilty of this. Oh, I didn't have enough time to spend 20 minutes. And so right. now I feel guilty and now I'm not going to give any effort. Uh, I think God can do a lot with a little. I think it was a great question. Yeah, I, um, I'm i going to add to it. I know it makes the episode a little bit longer. But um, you know, the question of, hey, what are some things I can do? What are the daily rhythms? I've gotten that question a lot through the mm-hmm. years. And I um, there, there's a part of me that dislikes the question because I have to respond and say, well, here's what works for me. Mm. You have to figure out what works for you and how you really stay connected with God, how you feel like you're, you are growing. Um, you know, all the things I said earlier are part of that daily for me. Like, remember who you are. That's more important than what you do. But um, one of the things that I do that I find um, success might not be the right word, but, you know, success in... You just seeing fruit. Yes, is, um, you know, I just started, you know... At, started journaling more consistently and always begin with three positives from the day. Um, Could be something with a lot of spiritual fruit and it could be, I got to eat ice cream last night and that was good. Ice cream's good. Uh, But just start with, you know, three positives of the day and then, all right, what are the things that are really bothering me? What's, what are the big questions that I'm wrestling with right now? And, you know, just journal out paragraph after paragraph of thoughts. And um, I mean, it's been years now, but I remember looking, I can look back and it was after about 18 months of doing that, that a light bulb finally clicked in my head. And I was like, uh, wow, look at this every week. I have, if I, if I do this daily, I have 21 positives from the week I can look at. And all of the other stuff that I wrote out um, usually has to do with one or two difficult situations I'm navigating through in life, uh, in that season, whatever it is. 
but the so the ratio is uh, twenty one to two of positives to negative mm. of good things that are happening versus things that are you know life draining. And um, that was just a switch for me, like, oh, there's a lot of good things happening in the world and in my life. Uh, Yes, there are situations that are completely zapping me of emotional and spiritual energy. And, and, you know, they are a reminder that, hey, life can be difficult, Uh, but these positives are outweighing that. Mm. And just being able to do that for an extended period of time, I was like, oh, um, you know what? Life's pretty good. Like I don't have a reason to be uh, discontent when all of these positive things are happening. So I don't know if that's a spiritual exercise that might benefit others or not. Uh, but that is one thing I still do today. Uh, I use a specific journaling app on my phone and computer. And uh, I've created a template so that whenever I start, it's like, what are your three positives mm-hmm. from the day or the day before? That's the first uh, heading. Uh, so I can always start that way. Yeah. You guys have anything else you want to chime in before we uh, fade out for this episode? I think it was a great question. Uh, I have more I want to share, but I know we're out of time. Um, so uh, as always, if you have more questions, you can feel free to send those in to us. Uh, we've got the information for the episode there listed at the bottom of the screen. And uh, as always, again, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, but it's been good catching up with you again uh, this week. And we hope to hear from you and we'll see you again here in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us.